So in this video, the next part of the neurological examination is to stand back, take the time to observe the animal in as natural an environment as possible. That might mean looking at a video of an animal going for a walk or moving about their own house, or uh, it will mean, if it's a dog, taking it outside and walking up, up and down in a relaxed manner on a leash. My next recommendation, and one that's relatively simple, but often bypassed by the busy person for understandable reason, is to take the time to observe the animal. And this really shouldn't be bypassed because you can gain so much information just by watching. And I'm especially talking to those of you who might be training in neurology residences. So often I see people rushing the animal through to do a neurological examination without actually taking time to watch. And this should be allowing the cat to walk free in the consulting room. I allow the animals to walk free whilst I'm taking a history and that gains me a lot of information and also allows the animal to relax a little bit. And I also, uh, if it's a dog, ask the owners to walk the dog outside on as long a leash as possible, allowing the dog to sniff up and down because then I can see the animal turning. I can see the animal, how the animal behaves in a natural environment. And better still, especially if it is a cat, ask them to provide a video so that you can see the animal in a more natural environment. This is a cat that uh, is quite an old video now, but I still love it because it really illustrates everything that I want to say. This was a cat that when it presented to the consulting room, it would look quite normal uh, and also was difficult to examine in the consulting room because of fear. And we can see this cat here looks, starts off looking maybe just a little bit odd, um, uh, uh, but walking relatively normal. And the thing about cats is as soon as they are tired, they sit down. And so just as you think you might be able to see some alteration, like, oh, uh, uh, no, we're not really tired here. We're just pretending to sleep. Um, so you just begin to see some, some uh, change in the gait. A lot of you will be thinking this cat perhaps looks slightly lame. That's very understandable. Oh, no, no, we're, we're perfectly fine here. Yeah, nothing to see, nothing to see. Can you just see how now as the cat walks a little bit further, the gait becomes a little bit short. Perhaps the neck is a little bit flexed, but he's a cat. So he's just going to go on and examine around here. Yeah, that's a very interesting fork. Yes, I like this very much. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I'm just going to, um, no, I'm not going to come towards the owner. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to sit down. I'm just going to sit down here like this. Now, the owner uh, focuses in on the cat at this point. Um, and I believe that's because they felt that was important. They felt the cat would sit uh, sitting down. Now here we see the cat displaying the, the signs a lot more obviously. A few short steps getting shorter and shorter and shorter and sh sits down, shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, sits down. And this is very characteristic of a cat with neuromuscular disease. Maybe a bit subtle, here is another cat with neuromuscular disease and myopathy. And you can see how much more difficult it is uh, observing these gates in the consulting room because of the fear associated with that. This cat is just going from one Heidi hole to another, but we can get the impression that this is a very weak cat. Notice that their mouth is open. Quickly, quick old dash there. And if we just take some stills, which you can see um, below there, we can see this uh, characteristic changes that this cat has. Uh, again, very um, typical for a cat with neuromuscular disease. We can see that there, it's adopting what I call an, uh, a mere cat posture. Uh, some people have referred to this as a kangaroo posture, which I don't think is quite as uh, uh, um, useful, but each to their own. Um, so they sort of sit back on their hind legs and sort of hold up um, their, their forelimbs. Uh, and it's very typical with a weak cat that's unable to extend its pelvic limbs. And this cat in particular has um, a proximal uh, muscle weakness and we can see the sort of winging of the cat uh, of the scapula this crunched um, uh, pelvic limb gait 
uh, low neck carriage and uh, in this cat's case, an open mouth. And so just by observing this rather nervous cat and in the other cat, we get an impression that the animal has neuromuscular disease and that will inform all of our other decisions without actually having to even lay a hand on the animal. Here is another couple of, of, of examples. Um, so this is examples of ataxia. And first of all, we have uh, an example of a proprioceptive ataxia due to spinal cord disease. And in this instance, that not only do they have proprioceptive deficits, that because of the compression on the uh, muscular upper motor neuron tracts, uh, then we also have weakness. Um, so we can see here, this cat is also weak, has a tendency to drag these limbs, poor sense of where their feet are, position is it's knuckling over there we can see that it's worse on one side compared to the other dragging the the uh, the limb um, there and if we compare this this one in comparison to a cat with vestibular ataxia we can see here and um, this cat with uh, ear disease it has an asymmetrical ataxia with a um, head tilt and wide-based stance. There's a tendency to deviate to the side of the head tilt. Was, this cat was featured in a video on circling. Cat's quite bright otherwise because it doesn't have um, brain disease, it has ear disease. You see the leaning over to one side, deviation to that side. And again, just by observing the animal, we already have um, localised this lesion much. Um, and we just need to refine it with our other neurological tests, such as proprioception. And here we have a cat with metabolic disease that's causing a cerebellar ataxia. And we can see this dysmetria, uh, an increased increased limb tone, giving a kind of goose stepping gait as sometimes it's referred to. It's characteristic of having cerebellar disease. So again, just by observing the cat, we've already made uh, some neurolocalization. Our next tip is assessing the cranial nerves. Hope to see you then.